Hey everyone, thanks for the opportunity to give a talk at this event. I am really excited to be part of it. My name is Perish and I work as a bioinformatics scientist at the University of Melbourne Centre for Cancer Research. My main focus and interest lies in the development of reproducible data analysis workflows and results, which is really important in clinical settings. In my talk today, I will highlight approach taken by my group at UMCCR to develop and deploy CWL workflows focused on omics data analysis in clinical settings using Illumina's connected analytics. So my talk is going to be composed of two major parts. The first one is CWL workflows and discussing some of the features we have used from CWL and then um, how we leverage ICA as an orchestration engine. Before moving on to the talk outline, I'm going to stop the video just because it's a bit distracting seeing yourself at the corner of the slides. So bear with me for a second. That's better. So start. I'm going to start with the group introduction and then um, followed by the discussion on ever evolving data methods and technologies that lead into reproducibility issues and how CWL help tackle these. I will next focus on CWL workflows implementation using Illumina Analytics platform and discuss a quick workflow example as well. At the end, I will summarize my part of the talk and pass over to my colleague Alexis for further discussion. Sorry, an ex um, extension of this work. So who we are, the University of Melbourne Center for Cancer Research comprises of various groups groups that aim to bring together university leaders committed to improving the outcomes and quality of life for people affected by uh, cancer. I am affiliated with the group highlighted in Red Square, that is genomics platform. We work on workflows and methods for the rapid analysis of cancer patients' genomes and transcriptomes as well. One of our main focuses at the moment is transitioning to cloud services, which can be orchestrated through CWL. In the picture, you can see the amazing people I work with. Oliver Healthman is our group leader. A bit introduction before I go into technical details regarding workflows implementation and orchestration. Ever since the completion of Human Genome Project, omics has emerged as a key focus for biomedical and clinical community. As a result, there has been a massive upsurge in the number of techniques and instruments developed to support data production and analysis. Due to production of this enormous amount of data and overheads to manage this data, virtualization technologies and move to the cloud are now readily being evolved and I should say considered at least. The question then raises is how do we pick from these hundreds of methods and technologies? Few factors that we, or I should say probably most of the research groups consider before deploying any method is for suitability in terms of if that method has sufficient information provided to help users run or implement the method. Validation, the tool is tested not only on the data provided with the method, but on the in-house data as well. Maintenance, how well maintained the work method is, and most importantly, support, how responsive are authors in terms of providing support to the community to fix and improve it. Using these carefully selected tools or methods, we have implemented a rapid whole genome and transcriptome pipeline for patients' data, focusing on the interplay between bioinformatics, which is majorly here in the pipeline, and IT infrastructure, which is in place to tackle two obstacles to reproducible analysis. The first one is accurate and complete reporting of all experimental and computational steps for reproducibility of results. The second one is ability to accurately reproduce software or runtime environment setting for the reproducibility of software environment. Taking these obstacles into consideration, we have chosen CWL as a representation language for our workflows since it is open source and community driven, which makes it easier to access support and ask for advice. Also, it is supported by multiple execution engines, which positions it at the top of the reproducibility range that comprises of three main levels. This is part of my PhD research. The bottom level is repeatability, which allows workflows to be repeated in the same runtime environment as the one it was created in. Replicability, where users can change or make slight changes in the runtime environment. And the top level is reproducibility, which is supported by standard, standardized approaches such as CWL, 
that have the least dependence on the specific runtime environment, make it impossible to run the workflows in new platforms. Moving on to CWL specific work at UMCCR, that is my group. Our primary workflows for genome and transcriptome data rely on both BC Bio and Dragon on AWS, but generating clinical reports from high throughput sequencing data requires slicing and dicing of data through various steps for attaining analysis. As shown in this chart here, to achieve reproducibility and portability, as discussed in the previous slide, we are in the process of transitioning to CWL for our main workflows and analysis. The transition to CWL is largely driven by Illumina University of Melbourne partnership, which leverages Illumina Connected Analytics. The ICA is a hosted environment for managing, processing, and analyzing genomics data. The platform provides interfaces for storing data and executing analysis workflows that can be used standalone or integrated with external software systems. Most importantly, it supports CWL, and the tools and pipelines are created either using GUI, which is Blue B, or command line by calling workflow execution services. The workflow creation is rather very simple. You write your workflow with a, using CWL, and then pack that workflow into a single JSON document and pass through the definition field of create workflow version API. In terms of technical details, we have managed to use and leverage common workflow language features via Illumina platform that uses task execution service specific namespaces and resources for instance type, tier and size, stream versus download for input modes are supported, HTTPS input support is also there, uh, users can specify or refer to log files of the workflows. Some of the other orchestration features that we have leveraged are using listing and load listing to allow uh, putting files in the designated output directory prior to executing the command line tools. Scatter gather is possible. At the launch time, engine parameters can be used to specify output work or temp directories, or simply to move or copy output between different locations. It's possible to override test requirements or use direct listing or directory input mode overrides, such as at the launch time, the user can specify that run tool one in the download mode or tool two, step two in the stream mode which is majorly dictated by the type of the analysis the tool is performing. Keeping these ICA features in mind, majorly the orchestration features, I would next quickly go through one of our very comprehensive workflows for germline data analysis that we have translated to CWL and ported over to ICA already. This is the overall representation of the workflow more information on how this workflow graph was generated is going to be presented by my colleague Alexis later. But here you can see the inputs, the steps, and the major outputs that are generated by the workflow. If I zoom in a bit, the sub workflow, which is what the first part is highlighted in purple, it uses a couple inputs and then basically filters and input CSV file to specific pointers. Also, some of the other steps that are part of the analysis are dragon step that does the main analysis, a couple QC stages, and human leukocyte antigen site discovery, which happens by another sub workflow uh, and uses optotype as a tool in the step. These are the requirements that we have used, uh, the CWL specific requirements for, the, for running and implementing this workflow. These are really important to develop and deploy such data-driven workflows using complex algorithms and platforms, um, for example, ICA. Being a researcher, I would like to use a study published by Atkinson et al. to summarize the information I have just presented. Data-driven workflows lie at the intersection between questions and hypotheses asked by the communities and teams. The answer to these questions are found by processing data and information through complex algorithms and computing platforms. This can only be effectively achieved by joint efforts between domain experts, data scientists, and workflow platform engineers that effectively then result in an ecosystem that can support domain-specific analysis through federated workflow languages and management systems. One example of the language is common workflow language. 
that thoroughly supports such analysis. Thanks a lot for listening to my part of the talk. If you have any comments, suggestions, or questions, I would be happy to take those uh, during discussion or Q&A time. I would now like to hand over to Alexis, who is a bioinformatician in the UMCCR Genomics Platform Group. He has worked closely on the early access ICA collaboration with Illumina and has been inventing ways for us to manage our collection of the workflows. Over to you, Alexis. Thanks, Suresh. Hey all, my name is Alexis Lucatini. I'm a bioinformatician at UMCCR. Today I'm going to discuss some of the challenges and solutions we've implemented to make sure that we can manage and version control our workflows collectively on ICA, which has had its novel challenges since we've all been working from home for the last 10 months. There's a lot to squeeze in here. I do apologize for talking quickly, but this session is recorded and you can slow me down at the press of the button. Two main aspects of this talk are extracting CWL graph files and then using GitHub Actions to automatically create a catalog of all of our workflows in the repository and nicely documenting how to deploy them with a little nice uh, interactive workflow graph to play with at the bottom of the page. Uh, so here's the problem. You have a Git repo in your team. Some of you are from a pure biological background, some are straight computer science, each have their own skills, knowledge and expertise. Approaches from everyone are all going to be a bit different. Furthermore, this isn't a one-man show. The people creating the workflows are really those to deploy them into production. Having a way to effectively have a how-to uh, manual reference is uh, for a workflow is essential, particularly when many of us are working remotely. For new maintainers, you're coming into a new environment, new team, there's so much to learn already. This is pivotal just to take the edge off. So now I'm going to quickly jump over to what all us CWL folks love so much. Subworkflows. Like a function to a script, subworkflows greatly improve modularization and thus collaboration, since your subworkflow may be useful for others in their pipelines. Dry typing stands for don't repeat yourself. The opposite is wet typing, which is short for write everything twice, or we enjoy typing. And I'm going to jump again into something that sparked this initiative. A pull request on the CWL tool repo changed the way that dot graphs could be generated from the CWL tool program. Firstly, a bit of color was added so we can easily distinguish inputs and outputs from steps. Tiny, unreadable slanted text on arrows were removed and just the high level workflow was shown, making a much simplified and easier to read graph. A prime example of benefits of open source software. So what exactly is a CWL dot graph? There are two main stages to get from a CWL workflow file to the image we saw on the previous page. First, we must create the dot file, which is written in graph description language using CWL tools print dot parameter. Then we call the Unix binary dot on this dot file to generate an image file. I spent some spare time just looking over that dot file to see what could be manipulated for the greater good. Broken down, Everything's much simpler than I thought. Like a CWL workflow, we have a set of inputs and outputs. Everything else here are the steps. The pi.parser enables easy object orientation importation of these dot files. We also read in the CWL workflow YAML file to determine if any of our step nodes are subworkflows. We then repeat this process for the subworkflow and generate a hyperlink to the subworkflow graph image from inside the node. We also color the node purple to indicate that it's a hyperlink and that more information lies underneath. And one last jump, while all of that could be encoded into a script, you're then having to make sure all of your colleagues who are creating workflows are then running this script in the right environment with the right versions to harmoniously have a document and graph for each of our workflows in the repository. People have other things to do. If you want something done universally and consistently, it should be done automatically. And this is where GitHub Actions comes in. In 3000 minutes of free compute per month, GitHub Actions has a massive range of different uses from ensuring that your code or someone else's pull request works in a suite of test data before it's merged into the main branch, to launching a process if a file or files of a certain type have changed. Action workflows can be triggered by time, on a push, using git tags, or changes to certain files in a commit or files with a certain suffix. In our case, we want to rerun the GitHub action if any files ending in .cwl change in our main branch. 
This means regenerating the Markdown catalog file and updating the SVG graphs embedded into each workflow's documentation page with valid hyperlinks to any sub-workflow graphs present in this workflow. So this is actually on our old repository. Well, it should be by the time you're, that you're listening to this. Nonetheless, we have a Markdown file here with the CWL tools and workflows split by our internal groups. This includes a collaborative group and a development group, uh, along with a production group as well. So if we set, uh, click on the last one here on our production germline workflow, it takes us to another Markdown page and the production, the documentation here is extracted from the CWL workflow YAML file. And we have a link to the path as well. And before I go into the graph here, we have the same thing for our input. So all of the items here, including the optional and type, are extracted and generated from the CWL workflow YAML definition file, along with the documentation here, which is for each of the inputs. And it also comes with a set of outputs as well. And if I click on the graph here, what we'll see is we do see those purple nodes uh, that we talked about whilst we're looking at the CWL graph. And this means that they're sub workflows. So now what we can do is we can actually click on these and it will take us to a new graph uh, that includes all of the steps of this sub workflow. So some things that I've learned about this project, uh, link tools and sub workflows to other files. Don't place them in line in your CWL workflow as this generates a different packed file object. And it also means that others can use your tools and sub workflows in their pipelines if they're own, their own separate files. Uh, build dot graphs from packed CWL JSON files only, as this generates more consistent results. Uh, from a GitHub Action side, like CWL workflows, they can be quite abstract and some planning might be required before you start trying to write them. Uh, in my experience, I like to use Lucid Flowchart for generating diagrams and mapping out my ideas first. And some general computer science advice is to not go reinventing the wheel. There's a lot to learn from reading and using other people's code. And in my case, uh, this was pivotal in the Cedar World parser and dot parsers. Something that I could have easily have done with some time myself, but there's always an edge case or two that someone else has thought of that you haven't. And if there's an edge case that you've thought of that's not in theirs, then you can always fix it up with a pull request and then you've got a comprehensive parser between the two of you. And finally here, just some references for your own convenience and some contact information uh, for Sarish and I. Thank you very much for listening.